if you think about the various factors that, to, that contribute to organizational differences in firm performance and competitive advantage, factors that might lead some firms to be innovative and highly productive versus factors that might lead other firms to be less productive, inefficient, or declining, surely one of those factors must be the quality and nature of the individuals within those organizations. After all, we've heard for decades from organizational leaders that their most important resource, their most valuable asset, is the people, the managers and employees within their uh, relative firms. However, what's fascinating about this is that we don't have a lot of actual theory or data that speaks to how these individual differences amongst people contribute to organizational differences in performance and competitive advantage. For example, if we think about individual differences in intelligence, cognitive ability, personality, knowledge, skill, or motivation. We could ask the question, how do those come together to result in some firms being highly productive and other firms being relatively inefficient or unproductive? One would think that we'd have a lot of data and theory to answer this question. After all, we have over 100 years of research in organizational psychology, organizational behavior, and human resources that seeks to understand that specific question. And yet, if we look at that literature carefully, what we actually find is that most of the empirical work has been linked between individual differences in personality and so on to in, uh, differences in job performance. And if we look at it from that perspective, almost all of our research has been constrained to the individual level of analysis, and we make a lot of assumptions and take a bit on faith that those differences we observe at the individual level contribute to differences that exist at the organizational level. Now there is a growing and larger literature on small groups and teams, and that literature also sheds some insights into the nature by which individual differences might contribute to organizational differences. But even here, we're largely limited to the small group setting, typically groups and teams that might have, say, less than 12, uh, maybe 15 people within them, and they don't really capture the complexity of what happens in large multi-unit organizations. Now on the other hand, there's a sizable literature that's adjacent to this individual uh, literature that's within the field of strategic management. Now this literature draws primarily from economics and sociology. And while it's also been very productive, it's primarily focused its attention on the firm or organizational level of analysis. And if we look at this level, what we tend to observe is that there are a variety of characteristics of firms, as well as a firm's competitive environment, that affect how it's going to perform over time and whether it will achieve competitive advantage. And yet, almost all of that research is constrained to the firm level and rarely considers the nature of the individuals within those firms, with the possible exception of research on top management teams and CEOs. So what we have is this interesting disconnect in that in a variety of ways, different literatures are interested in understanding how people within them may contribute to organizational differences in performance, and yet almost all of these literatures stop short at that connecting area between organizations, individuals, and small groups. Well, recently there's been a, a bit of a revolution, if you will, from within the strategic management area that seeks to understand what these individual level or what these micro foundation origins of strategy and competitive advantage might be. Now this research is, and theory is very fascinating because what it does is it seeks to understand differences at the firm level based on the nature of individuals within those firms. However, it's not just the nature of the people, but it's the manner in which they collaborate, interact, and communicate that transforms their individual characteristics into something that's unique and different at the collective level. So a focus on micro foundations very much seeks to connect strategic thinking with psychological thinking. But the reality is this is a new area that's recently emerging and in fact is evolving very quickly. So most of what might comprise these mic micro foundations is very much still an area of, of speculation and beginning to be an area of scholarly study. The point of the chapter that my co-author Donnie Hale and I wrote was to try to stimulate psychologists to think about these micro foundations. Psychology has a lot to offer the understanding of micro foundations and in particular how these individual characteristics might combine through interaction and coordination to become something that at the collective level is very different. However, it's not simply going to be the case that we generalize individual level or small group psychological theory and apply that directly to the organizational level. Rather, it's going to require that these individual level theory and findings are in fact transformed fairly radically once we shift them to the level of the firm.
in the chapter, we try to lay out an agenda for how scholars might uh, attempt to tackle this uh, somewhat difficult question. And in doing so, we tried to identify areas where we think are going to be most productive and places where we can find the most uh, early wins, I guess you'd say, within this uh, um, scholarly enterprise. And one of those areas that we believe very strongly is going to be an effective place to start is by focusing on resources. Now, resources are simply capacities for action. Much like a, bas a battery has a capacity uh, which can be applied to a number of different devices. Well, psychologists have been studying resources for a long time. And we think about resources in terms of psychological sense, uh, in terms of a psychological sense, such as cognitive ability, intelligence, motivation, and so on. Well, these psychological resources may also exist at the small group or team level. For example, group composition is the combination of individual resources, which can then be combined and leveraged to influence emergent mediating processes and then ultimately team performance. Likewise, at the firm level, resources exist, but studied in a different way. Research coming from the tradition of the resource-based view would argue that resources can lead to the implementation or design of strategy because, uh, and, and particularly competitive advantage, if those resources are valuable, rare, inimitable, and non-substitutable. So what we find then is that resources have in many ways been studied at all of the respective organizational levels, but what's missing is the connection between them. Well, in our chapter, we've tried to argue that we can pick an area where we can study the resources of the same phenomena at different levels and try to understand how they connect uh, vertically. So for example, we talk a lot about human capital resources. Human capital being the knowledge, skills, abilities, or other characteristics of individuals that may be uh, at, at by themselves or um, at the collective level, such as a group or team or the organization. And if we think of human capital resources as a resource or a capacity for action, we can start to think about the various ways then that the psychological treatment of resources is aligned or misaligned with the strategic view of resources. To give you just one example, one of the dominant findings from the individual level literature is that cognitive ability is one of the strongest predictors of individual job performance. And that relationship tends to generalize across most major jobs in the U.S. economy, as well as the importance of cognitive ability becomes greater as the complexity of the job becomes greater. That's a long-standing finding, and one of the key points then is that a firm that uses cognitive ability as a basis for hiring should see a number of positive benefits. Now, if we contrast that prediction to what we might find by generalizing and trying to understand how cognitive ability transforms to a collective resource at the firm level, we might not necessarily make those same predictions. For example, relationships that exist at the firm level tend to be much more contextualized than what we would find at the individual level. If cognitive ability emerges into a, a resource that exists at the collective level, then the question becomes, would all firms that have that resource perform si similarly? The case might be that they perform similarly if they have the same level of the resource, but strategy research would suggest, and strategy theory would suggest, that in fact that relationship might be affected by the firm's competitive environment, and certainly it may not contribute to competitive advantage. The key thing with competitive advantage is that it involves differentiating the firm from competitors so that a firm with competitive advantage is able to achieve above normal returns relative to other firms. What this means then is that it should not simply be the case that greater cognitive ability at the firm level contributes to greater performance, but more so that firms are better able to accumulate and leverage that cognitive ability resource to generate a competitive advantage, to differentiate themselves from competitors. That differentiation is not likely to be a generalizable relationship, and thus relationships we see at the uh, firm level should be more contextualized than what we might find at the individual level. That's just one of the examples that we talk about in this chapter, but it raises a number of very interesting questions about how the, the individual level literature on psychological characteristics and job performance integ integrates with the strategy literature which tends to look at firm level resources and competitive advantage. And we speculate in the chapter that there are a lot of areas where once we try to integrate these different fields, that they're likely to counter or be actually contradictory to some of the existing findings and assumptions that we've, looked, we've uh, held for a long time when looking at these literatures in isolation.
So our bottom line point is that it will take a large shift in the thinking of psychologists to start to think about their work from the perspective of competitive advantage and strategy, but in doing so, it's likely to also significantly extend their work into exciting and fascinating new ways.